I want to talk to you, though, this morning about something that uh, I, I hate kind of coming towards the end of a conference, because everybody's preached your message 20 times, <laughs> and you just kind of kind of want to, you know, just say, well, let's just pray and go home, but I got too big an ego to do that, too, so, so you're going to hear me whether you want to or not, and uh, <clears throat> so one of the things I do, I just preach it myself. And that way, at least one person will get convicted in the service. And, uh, and I'll admit to you, I wish I was more spiritual. Amen. I've had some pretty spiritual men call me carnal in my lifetime. And so uh, sometimes what we're talking about is probably obvious to everybody here, and nobody needs it but me, but I need it, so I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and I... I think that in some ways, we think we live in probably the greatest time ever to be a Christian. And we, we do, to a real dimension. If you really think about it, there are things that we believe and experience and do that no one in Christianity has ever really understood by <coughs> the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Only about 150 years. By healing, maybe 200 years. Salvation by grace, 300 Amen. There is all this powerful stuff that is a part of, of our experience, and yet, in some ways, we're struggling more than any Christians ever have. And the Bible talks about that and, and warns about it. It was Manny Vallejo that uh, told me the story about one of Dobson's old programs, amen, and uh, where he uh, had a group of secular psychologists, and they were talking about how that there is, this is the greatest time to ever be alive. People are living longer, healthier. There are all kinds of positives that are happening, and yet there is more suicide, higher depression than ever before. And so they begin to study. They were looking, trying to figure out how it was. This was in the 80s, I think it was, that they, they had done this. And so there were people that were still alive that had gone through the Great Depression, World War II. They'd had it kind of tough, and yet they seemed to be healthier than the people, and they began to come to the conclusion that the problem uh, was that these people had a view of eternity that stabilized them. That today, I think that if we're not careful, we all believe in heaven, but we don't think about it enough. So I want you to think with me uh, about heaven. I, I think it gets our eyes in the right place, amen, and can help us to understand sometimes what we think is important you know, if I had my first prayer, it would be to be rich. I want to be rich. Anybody else want to be rich? Amen. You know what? I just listened to this guy telling the story about how God told him how to become a multimillionaire, and he's a multimillionaire today. And I'm kind of half bitter. <laughs> I remember this guy preached one of the best sermons I ever heard, a friend of mine, and he played the, the song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. You know, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Blue, blue birds fly, and I'd never listened to it before, and, and it's a lament. So, you know, she uh, she's, feels depressed because uh, somewhere over the rainbow, blue birds fly. Why? Why not me? Well, God, why not me? Why, why don't I have a big church? Why don't I have a new car? You know, anybody relate to what I'm saying? And in fact, this can be, I think, the greatest dis di uh, distraction that there is in life. Joe was telling us a story of when we had gone to Kenya, and there are all these people. And if you ever go to one of these countries, you just, it, the poverty and uh, the price is there. And he's praying, amen, and he's asking God to bless these people and, and help them. And he hears the voice of God. Amen. And God says to him, are you accusing me of not caring for these people? And so Joe was shocked, <laughs> kind of horrified. You know, I, I, no, no, I'm not accusing you. And then, and then God says to him, you're such an American. Amen. <laughs> and he goes, what, what do you mean? You're such an American. You think you're blessed because you've got cars and houses and all these things. And he begins to think and realize these people pray for hours. They love God. And I think that if we're not careful, I know so many. How many know people, the most dangerous time in, 
in Colorado is when the Broncos start to play again. <laughs> Church is empty across the state. People don't have time because the Broncos are playing. Well, I, I, you may go to hell because of the Broncos. <laughs> so I better, I better leave that alone. How many know people have backslid because they could make double time on Sunday? And so church isn't important enough. I mean, this is the day that we live in. Or kids, I know a guy, I think of a guy, one of the best Christians I knew, that backslid because his kids were playing soccer and he just quit coming to church. And he was just going to do it for the soccer season. But it ended up for years. Wave at me if you know people like what I'm talking about. And, and today. So anyway, let, let's move on. Because <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a greater test. For the first 1,700 years of the church, amen, if you really think about it, it was horrible. Horrible. Life was horrible. If you go back any time at all, people only lived to about 35 was the average age, up until about 100 years ago. Uh, governments were corrupt dictators, kings that cared nothing about people. War was almost continuous. You know, they, they had one war what, that they called the Hundred Year War. That's a long war. And it was only a couple of weeks between the next one that started up. War is continuous in, around the world, in every nation, in every place. Poverty was everywhere. Famines would wipe out millions. And Christianity has grown and thrived until our day. And it's only in our day, and they call it modernity, that Christianity has begun to lose, and it's in the Christian countries, in Europe and Canada, and even in the United States, that Christianity has weakened. And I think it has to do because heaven was the heartthrob of the church, and today we can almost think we don't need God to be happy. And, and how many of us have ever had that sense that if I just had a better car, if I just had a little better friends, <laughs> then everything would be better. Let's think about heaven for a minute. It says in Revelations 21, 1 to 4, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe, God, listen to this, God shall wipe away every tear mm. <laughs> from their eyes. Oh, my God. What are you going to do, Ryan, when you can't cry anymore? <laughs> I, I just, I, I repent. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was just a setup. <laughs> I could not give it. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither, neither sorrow, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. <laughs> For the former things yeah. are passed away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love the stories about heaven. When I got saved, D.L. Moody was kind of my hero, and he had a book on heaven. I think about it as I'm putting this sermon together. And he talked about how when he was a young man, heaven was this place with gold streets and pearls, gates of pearls, and angels flying around, but it was cold. It was distant. It wasn't until the first of it, people he knew passed away that heaven became a place that was filled with life and filled with friends. As I even look around, this crowd, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot missing. Mike Neville, hallelujah, Coney, or Roscoe. Amen. Heaven is becoming more and more a place that I'm attracted to. My mom, my dad. Amen. You know, I'd, I'd love to be the guy that you came to when you had a prayer that needed to be prayed. And I've seen some answered, but the one that I, I, know, I know was answered was when my mom, she was 
she was sick. She was having problems with her heart and even mental issues of remembrance as age can do. And we were there, the three, my three brothers and my sister, and she was in a coma. And I never get my brother looks at me and he says, Ron, I think God wants you to pray. <laughs> but it wasn't for healing. It was that she would die. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to be known that <laughs> when you, you're, you need to die, call Ron. <laughs> There's a story about Mestis that I could tell right now, but it would distract us all. You can ask me later. But my God, heaven is the heart of the message of Jesus Christ. The last words of D.L. Moody were these when he died. Earth recedes, heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There's no valley here. God's calling me. I must go. <laughs> God, I hope I remember to say something that's, <laughs> that's not stupid as I'm dying. You know, where's my car keys? Here's the problem. Think with me about several things. We're distracted by today. We're distracted, I think, by the now. And there's a dangerous trend today. I think this can be crippling Christianity. And, and I think it's affecting. And I think it's even affecting us more in some ways today than it has in a long time because of COVID. And what happened to COVID? Christians just stayed home. And, and they would rather stay home than go to church. How many have lost? Hundreds of people just in this crowd, the churches. And, and it's because of the distraction of the world that it, that <laughs> don't become weary in well-doing, the Bible warns us. In the last days, perilous times will come. And what are they? Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Distracted by... Lovers of their own self, covetous boasters. And it, and it has to do with the blessing. And some of this is the fault of Christianity. There's never been a greater time to be alive than today. There's less uh, horror in government. There's democracy. There's, there's all these blessings. And they're all directly, I don't have time to go into a result, I think, of the gospel. Of taking the Bible serious. Of living with more integrity and character. Of Christianity spreading in nations where it hasn't. And love and forgiveness becoming more of a channel. But at the same time, it has become maybe the greatest attack on Christianity. And I have to know myself that probably one of the things that I wrestle with is that thing. Why? Why not I? You know, that there's a way that we can preach the gospel that, that makes it seem like I shouldn't have any real sadness or sorrow. That I shouldn't have any bills. I shouldn't uh, be sick. By His stripes we're healed. And I love that. And hear me, I'm not assaulting. I, I don't even know how you could preach once you know the truth. And not talk about the blessing. But that is not why Jesus died. He didn't die just so we could have a better now. Am I making sense this morning? Does anybody hear what I'm saying? And so there's something here important to understand. I think there are too many Christians that are bored and disappointed and angry. And it's because they, they have completely lost. You're supposed to be sad. You're supposed to, to a degree, feel empty. You know, in the garden, thank God Adam didn't eat the tree of life. Amen. Thank God they got thrown out of the garden. God, wouldn't it suck if we were stuck in this life forever? If we never go to heaven? Amen. We'd never transcend. I God, that's a nightmare. Hallelujah. And yet... I know Christians, and I know myself that I come. Listen to a couple of interesting scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. If Christ be not risen, there's, our preaching is vain, and our faith is also vain. That, that's the Apostle Paul. He, he wrote that. This is a guy. I think Paul, how many, how many think Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost? I, I mean, the guy had raised people from the dead and all these kinds of stuff. I mean... 
He, he had had it all. And yet listen to what he says. In this life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. Can, can I get honest? Uh, you know, even though I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, even though I've seen miracles that are happening, and so still, life sucks. <laughs> Look at the person next to you and say, life sucks. Life sucks. Amen. This is not the end. And if you think this is it, no wonder you're mad. No wonder you're angry. No wonder you don't want to go to church anymore. They're just going to make me feel guilty because I'm hurting, because I have cancer. Amen. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Get cancer, go to church, and feel horrible because you can't get healed. Feel embarrassed because you got to go to the altar every week again and again to get prayed for for nothing to happen. You know, you're not the only person. Because there's something about this life that it is not the goal. Amen. And everybody loses. Have you read your Bible? The devil's in charge. <laughs> Thank God we can restrain, restrain him some, and we can fight him, and we can do some things. And, and I, I'm glad I'm a Christian, but my God, there's a price that comes with this life. Amen. There's a cost. And especially if I listen to any of these preachers that have been preaching, Reggie, what a guilt trip he threw on me. Amen. <laughs> and I think if I were to say it, he would accuse me of being the one that inspired him that I, I preached in the past. <laughs> Has anybody heard there's a real devil? There's a real devil. I read a book by Greg Laurie, and it's called Lynn and Dylan, Alice and Jesus, and it's a... It's an interesting book because it just talks about, and he, he goes through all these famous people. See, even if I think, even if I had all the stuff I think I need, I'd probably still be unhappy. You know what I mean? All these people that choked on their own vomit, and <laughs> amen, you know, or drug addicts and alcoholics and all these kinds of stuff. This is a fallen world. And it's fallen even for us as believers. T.L. Osborne, probably one of the greatest faith preachers alive, had a son that committed suicide. Amen. Rick Warren, biggest church in America, his son committed suicide. Or Roberts, alcoholic son, they can happen. That, this, this is, everybody's going to get kicked in the face somewhere. Amen. It's a fallen world. It's a fallen world. The greatest, Jimmy Swaggart. Ted Haggard, I mean, thousands in their churches, TV programs, and they blew it. Why? Because we live in a broken world. Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Thank God, though, for grace. Thank God for heaven, for eternity. My life and my story, amen, I was accused. I won't mention any names, but if you are here, you know who it is. <laughs> I knew I was going to preach on struggle. And you know why? Because I've struggled. Now, I could be like most of you, just lie all the time. <laughs> That's right. Most preachers are really horrible liars. They're preaching all the time about joy and happiness. And I know you. I've sat with you after church, and I feel like I'm sitting with the devil. And, and uh, I better, well, I better get off. I got to get out. But my first pastor, my first pastor embezzled $2 million from the church, brutalized. I've had, I, I had a whole fellowship turn against me. Amen. Part of why me and Mark get along. We've been thrown out of several <laughs> fellowships. And it was unjust. It was unfair. Anybody ever had anything unfair happen to you? Where you just wonder, what the heck's going on? It's probably God doing something great in your life. I, the heaviest experience I ever had probably in my life was with Albert Contreras, and we'd been talking about the struggle. And I went back to the car afterwards, and I couldn't even drive for a half hour. I just shook. And God showed me that what I thought was his betrayal was his greatest gift that he ever gave me. And he protected me from ego and pride. And in breaking me, changed me. Get, can I get an amen? Amen. And so I think that part of our problem is 
that we're not taking serious that in Romans 8 it says not yet. They're, we're not there yet. That there is supposed to be. There's supposed to be something that, yes, I, like I say, God, I don't want to be a sinner. Amen. I don't, I don't want to be a sinner. I, I'm glad I got saved. I'm not saying that I'm not. I'm fighting for healing and for miracles and have been blessed beyond measure. But this isn't it. This isn't it. And I, I think there's something here. Listen to Colossians 3, 1, 3. If then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ suffereth on the right hand of God. Set your affection. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. You know what the problem with me is? I'm like Frankenstein. I keep coming back to life. <laughs> oh my God, he's alive! <laughs> but it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> Amen. We're supposed to die to all of this. And yet there's a way of preaching, like I say, that if, if not careful, that I think we have, to, we have to listen and we have to not be so shocked when we face struggle. Amen. What's the answer? Quickly, a couple. Claim the promises. Claim healing and prosperity. I'm definitely not for, uh, you don't want to make life more worse than it is. Amen. Let's, let's party some. And not just in graveyards, but <laughs> I'm, I get the, the deal. But let's have a few more potlucks and stuff. It's not horrible to make life livable. I think that's why we're supposed to live and, and forgive. And the prophetic is supposed to be edification and exhortation and, and comfort because it's a tough life. And without God, it can't be lived. And so there's something here that is critical. Embrace the hope, though, of heaven. It's not just the blind, the sick, the lame, the crippled that can long for heaven. I remember reading Johnny Erickson's book. She was crippled when she was 17 and jumped into a pool. And she talks about how she's tried to encourage, you know, people that are struggling and people that were worse than her. Can you imagine there, there are people that can't do anything but blink their eyes? No hands, no feet. I watch those St. Jude commercials. They just kill me. You know, a little kid rolls out in a wheelchair. You know, you, you're giving that... <laughs> that makes me able to walk, and he can't even walk. Amen. And thank God. Thank God for heaven. I remember reading a biography of this one guy that was a leper, and he said the greatest gift he ever had was because he was a leper. He was raised in India. He was there, and, and because he was a leper, he met a Christian doctor, and he got healed, but more than anything, he got saved. Hallelujah. So there's something here. Why is it so important? Well, I think the only thing that makes sense out of Jesus this morning is heaven. You know, Jesus was the greatest loser in the world. I mean, if there's no heaven, then when I see loser, well, I guess if there's no heaven, I won't see him. But, but if I saw him and there was no heaven, I'd go, you're a loser, Jesus. I mean, live a good life give up everything, and then die on the cross, that is horrible. That's the a, that's a definition of a loser. But he rose from the dead. He conquered death. That's what makes the story. Paul says, if there's no heaven, says, then we're, we're idiots. Now, I, I'm glad. I'm glad that some of you got saved. When I hear your testimonies, thank God you're not my neighbor. Amen. <laughs> slept with my wife, stole everything I had. <laughs> Thank God you're safe. Amen. But you know what? If there's no heaven, maybe I should do that. You know, Paul says, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Set up a couple kegs outside the door. You know, get some Holy Ghost marijuana. <laughs> just, let's just get loaded and party down. Amen. But it's heaven that makes a life of integrity, a life of holiness pay Amen. I don't think Jesus is a liar. And there's so many things in the Bible that I haven't experienced. I don't have a mansion. 
<laughs> God, I'm in Pueblo. I don't even know if they have one there. <laughs> oh, wait, I remember one. <laughs> It, it, Christianity makes no sense. In Hebrews 11, it talks about faith, and faith can. Faith can cause arcs to be built and children to be born and, and powerful things to happen. But it also says there were those that were tortured and died in their faith. The world is filled with Christians today. There are probably almost as many that are suffering rejection and pain and are being tortured or live in poverty that is almost hopeless in countries where there's almost no hope for them to prosper. And yet they have faith that's vibrant. Ha, I was in, I, they asked me to come to Indonesia to preach to pastors that were from Vietnam and China and all these places. And, and I asked them what they want me to preach on. They said they asked me to preach on suffering. <laughs> like I said, you know, last thing I wanted to go into ministry, I wanted to be a prosperity guy. I want to be the guy you brought in for healing. I didn't want to be the guy... Hey, we want to talk about suffering. Hey, you know Ron, he knows something about that. <laughs> but then it hit me. At least I'm known for something. <laughs> I was in India. 300 pastors, most of them from the northern part of India. The guys I was with got sick. So I was there by myself with all these pastors. And I began to ask their story. And, and, and I'll never forget. These guys, can you imagine in their church it was not uncommon for Hindu mobs to attack their church with baseball bats and to beat them. There are places in North Korea that, that, you, that they can't sing out loud. They just have to, to mime and pretend they're singing, and they have to meet in the woods because it's illegal to be a Christian. And yet they meet, <laughs> and they worship. Only heaven explains the Bible. We face trials and difficulty, but we can face them. Why? Because... That not, nothing of this stuff matters. All things are going to work together for the good. All the pain is going to be paid back. It's going to make sense. It just doesn't make sense. You know, I, it's been on me here lately, even as I've been thinking about this. From, the Bible says that, you know, we're saved by, by grace, not by works. Not by works. And I've always thought of that, you know, in kind of a theological or uh, a religious context, but you know what? I think it's really saying there are. There, this is going to be so phenomenal when when we go to heaven that all the good that I could do is going to. Be, I'll be the first one to throw the crown. I see the Roscoe's. I can't help but think I can't imagine that when Coney went to heaven that there weren't. Tens of thousands of people there saying, I'm here because of you. I traveled with him around the world. That's why we do it. That's what it's about. And if you're struggling with your Christianity and your faith, it's because I think you're full of the world. You're full. <laughs> now I'm, I better shut up. God, it's so easy to get distracted. Wave at me if you know what I'm talking about. Am I talking to anybody? That, you know Smith Wigglesworth, his wife, Polly, died. He rushed home. She was already in the coffin. Can you imagine? He pulled her out of the coffin, threw her against the wall, and called her back to life. That's pretty potent. And what did she do? Send me back. <laughs> Say, what would I want to do here? I've been in heaven. Amen. And we don't get it if we're not careful. The world can never satisfy. The rich young ruler had it all. Jesus, what does he say? He says to him, if thou want to be perfect, go and sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Why? So that you'll have treasure in heaven. Heaven. Hey, Matthew 5, blessed are you. And it's all the things that I don't want. I don't want to be hungry. You don't get my size by letting yourself get hungry very often. Blessed when you're hungry. Blessed when you mourn. Blessed when everybody turns against you. Amen. Any pastors relate to that? <laughs> you know? And yet why? Because there's a reward laid up for you. Where? Amen. Not, not in Denver. Amen. But in heaven. We see through a glass darkly. Amen. Most of the Bible hasn't come to pass yet. 
there's still huge gaps between what we're thinking and do it. So, and it's the purpose of life to deny ourselves to a certain degree, isn't it? Take up your cross, deny yourself. Amen. Not just, though, to deny yourself, not because there's any tremendous value, but because there are going to be rewards. Because there's something coming that's so much more phenomenal that you don't even want to take a chance. I mean, oh my God, hopefully we won't throw away our eternity, amen, so that we can sleep in on Sunday morning. And yes, so many people do. It's the heart of faith. And it can, can be the thing that moves you and changes your life. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. Heaven. Me and Joe, we had only been men, men, pastoring him for probably a year and a half and me for a year. And we went with Jack Harris to Mexico. And uh, it, 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 was, it was great and horrible all at the same time, which is so much of Christianity, isn't it? Great and horrible all at the same time. And we were coming back to go back. And it, and it was, for me at least, and, I, and me and Joe talked about it a little bit, it was hard. We were pioneering, him and Winslow, me and Payson. And, and it's hard. And, it, and it's, it, there were real devils and, and real struggles. And we had stopped in Phoenix to see a friend of ours that had played a part in our getting saved. And this guy was going to this mega church. And he was the song leader, but he just did what he wanted to do. You know, there's a style of Christianity that's, that they don't want you to go to Africa. <laughs> they just want you to be happy, be blessed all the time. That's kind of what salvation is about. And this is this friend of ours. That was kind of what he was. And here we are going back to the mission field almost. <laughs> and they had Richard Wormbrand there preaching. I'll never get it as long as I live. It was a turning point of my life in many ways. Because they, <laughs> I, they, they, I'm thinking of all kinds of stuff about the story. Remember we met, his wife was there. She gave us a bunch of books. And they, he introduces her and says she was in prison in Russia for seven years. And they would take her and they made her stay with the, with the prostitutes because she was a godly woman and they wanted her to feel dirty. And in the middle of the winter, they would go and break the ice on the river and throw her in the river into the freezing water and say, you're being baptized. Serve Jesus now. Thank God for what you have today. And he got up, and when he went to preach, he said, I apologize. I'm going to have to sit down because I can't stand for more than five minutes. For 14 years, he was in prison, first with the Germans and then with the Russians, and they beat his feet in order to break him, and he can't stand for long periods of time. He said, I was watching TV today. And there was a preacher, and he was saying, ha, ha, ho, ho, he, he, Jesus died for my sins. And I'll never forget, and I'll always hear, as he said, Jesus' death isn't a ha, ha, he, he kind of thing. And he told a story about a pastor that he knew in Romania. And uh, he was in a city of the church there, and the partisans had killed a Nazi sergeant. And in World War II, when they killed a German, they would go to the nearest city and they would pick 10 men and they would kill them for every one German that was killed. And they had lined up 10 men. And this young boy comes in. He goes to the, to the Nazi and he says, do you care who dies? And they say, well, we just picked 10 randomly. And he looks at him and he says, that guy there, can I take his place? He says, he has seven sons, and if he dies, but I've done nothing. And the guy said, sure, take his place. And so he walked up. He walked up to that man, true story. And he walked up to that man. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to take your place. But says, I want you to know this, that for as long as you live, your life belongs to me. 
I've given my life up so you can live. And then Wormbrand looked at us and he said, that's Jesus. When you should have gone to the cross, he said, let me take your place. And our life is not our own, but it belongs to him. Father, we pray. We pray, God, that you would free us from our selfishness, our blindness. God, we have been corrupted, corrupted by the world and by a devil that we almost like better than you some days. God, we repent. We repent. But we hear the voice. We hear the call. God, we commit ourselves. Amen. To, 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 to be those people that you would have us to be. Well, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is there anybody here this morning you would say, I, I need to lay my life down. I, I need to break with some stuff. And I need to make more room for God to fill me. You'd raise your hand. You'd put it up. Put it down. Amen. 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 It's time for us to come and, and just recommit. This is the greatest group. You can look at me. Greatest group of people, I think, on earth in many ways. And yet we still are broken. <laughs> I just had last Wednesday before last, I was at Bible study. And God's told me, I, I don't hear his voice, but it was just as clear as anything. And he said, you need to think of yourself as handicapped. As, as handicapped. I was kind of shocked by that. What's it mean? You know, how many could admit you're not as good as you think you are? <laughs> as long as we compare ourselves to each other, we seem phenomenal. But we, that's not the comparison. We, we need help. My knees are giving me trouble. I had to get a walker here a while back. You know what? And I need it at times. You just can't even move. And I think that's us. We need grace. We need forgiveness.